So in St. Peter's Basilica, there is uh, an enormous, very, very impressive statue of St. Louis Marie de Montfort. It's all kind of dramatic and big. And what's uh, different as well, one, someone with maybe a slightly more artistic eye than mine might notice, is that a lot of the statues there in St. Peter's, they're, they're very impressive, but also the, the, the statues of men look manly, right? They've got, they've got manly saints there. That might sound, well, of course they are. What else, how else are they supposed to look? Well, in recent decades, uh, most men saints have somewhat more of a kind of a pose like that. You know, I'm St. Joseph holding a lily. Or I'm, you know what I mean, St. Louis Mead de Montfort holding a rosary beads. And it's always kind of this lip, limp wristed and fingers doing all sorts of strange things, which they don't normally do. I don't know why that is. But um, whatever the point of it is, it's ridiculous and kind of please stop. Um, because I think men, men saints have to look like Men, right? They should be men, they should be manly. And this is fantastic to see in St. Louis Marie de Montfort. We've got a combination of two things which generally we don't stereotypically associate. Um, he was a, one of the most famous, thank God, devotees of our Blessed Lady, and yet at the same time, a man's man, right? So from uh, Normandy up on the top of France, uh, from Brittany, so when Brittany, when the Britannians, uh, when they invaded England back in the day, then England ended up being bigger than Brittany, so they called it Great Brittany. Great Britain, that's how it got the name. I didn't actually know that until recently. So there you go. So, um, uh, yeah, so they were, they were a, a, a fighting people, and apparently Louis Maid Monfort himself was quite a large, substantial kind of a man, and one of the few men who in his village could lift a barrel of molasses over his head. I'm sure Liam, who did the reading, would be able to manage it too, but Louis Maid Monfort was able to manage it back in the day. So a barrel of molasses clean over his head, which is a base, basically a overhead press. Uh, so he was able to manage that. So a big guy. And uh, quite a, a fiery temper as well, which he was able to form or use uh, in his zeal for Our Lady. And Lord knows, was he going to need it. Um, Jansenism had spread across France uh, which also, by the way, spread into England, and we held on to it long after the French kind of got over it. But Jansenism is uh, its a heresy that focuses an awful lot on the depravity of human nature. So the fall of man, the sin of man, and everything is, is very, very heavy and sin-based rather than mercy, grace, freedom, children of God. All these kind of expressions um, are, are, are uh, much less used and there's a much greater focus on, on sin and repentance and self-scourging and all of that kind of thing. So it's a very, very negative view of, of our faith. So this was rampant in, in France and St. Louis, Louis preached uh, very much against that and preached about us being set free through our baptism. That brings us to an interesting point. His consecration to Our Lady um, sometimes... Again, there may be a danger of us misunderstanding how the consecration works. The consecration isn't like a mere devotion or a kind of a, an on-the-side kind of a, a thing. What he wants us to do through the consecration to Our Lady, so this idea of uh, placing ourselves under Our Lady's protection, under Our Lady's guidance, and giving all of our prayers to her, the reason he wants us to do that, or he advocates this, is that this is the perfect way of fulfilling our baptismal promises. Okay, so it's not a kind of a, if you will, a kind of a, a devotion on the side, but this is about getting back to the basics of our baptism. You know, I think that's, that's very, it's very healthy and helpful to know. Otherwise, if you're ever talking to uh, a person of a slightly more Protestant persuasion, they'll say, what's all this, like, Marian devotion about, Marian consecration? It's just ridiculous. It's just a distraction from Jesus, the one mediator between God and man. So... Why? Why do it? Like, why bother? So, he wants to get to get back to to the root of of our life in Christ, which started with our baptism. Okay, so uh, in his the beginning of his of his Marian consecration, he starts by renewing this 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 these baptismal promises. So I, and you insert your name, a faithless sinner, renew and ratify today in thy hands. The vows of my baptism. I renounce 
forever. Satan, his pumps and works, and I give myself entirely to Jesus Christ, the incarnate wisdom, to carry my cross after him all the days of my life and to be more faithful to him than I have ever been before. Okay, so again, that's important to keep in mind. It's not a kind of a devotional little cherry on the cake or something. This is about getting back to our baptism. We belong to Christ. You know, we think of what, what St. John writes in the first letter, in his first letter, uh, where he says, think of the love that the Father has lavished on us by letting us be called children of God. And that is what we are. So we're getting back to this reality of we are children of God. Do you live like one? Do you live in that awareness? awareness. Do you live in, in that awareness that you are a, a, a child of God? I, I don't think many of us could say we do, to be honest. Even myself. Not enough, not enough, not enough. Absolutely not enough. So... By following Our Lady's example, Our Lady is the perfect daughter of the Father. Okay, No sin, never sinned, never broke that communion with the Father. The perfect mother of the Son. Okay, just, I mean, how, how more perfect a mom could you have than Our Blessed Lady? Okay, and the perfect bride of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes upon her, and what she conceives within her is holy. So she's the perfect example. She's the perfect example to follow in order to fulfill our baptismal promises, in order to live this reality of being children of God. So you see how these things, done, we should never just degenerate, or how would you say, degrade these devotions to just kind of a little on-the-side thing. This is about getting back to basics so that we don't miss the basics. And Lord knows have we missed the basics. <laughs> Uh, in, in the church, maybe even for decades, like getting back to the, the centrality of the Eucharist and the centrality of prayer, all of these simple things, simple in a way, but get back to them. What do they mean? What do they give us? This is what Louis, Louis Miriam Manford is calling us to. So he used to preach uh, a lot, an awful lot. He was ordained in the year 1700, and um, I think it was at 16 years of priesthood he had. And he died at the age of 43. So two years older than me, and he died, and had a huge influence uh, throughout France. He was quite hated. I remember once one of our brothers, we were, uh, when we have our evening prayer in my own community, uh, different people lead meditations, and one of them came across a quotation from St. Louis de Montfort, and normally the quotations are, you know, they're, they're very nice, you know what I mean? Let us give our hearts to Jesus, and it's all very nice. But he read this meditation, where he said uh, St. Louis was in a, a parish preaching a mission and he had a, a brother with him and the mission was going really well, right? People were coming to confession, there were long lines, people were uh, thronging in from everywhere to hear the preaching and, and it was fantastic, it was all going so well. And uh, so St. Louis turns to his brother and said, okay, now we must leave. The brother said, but why? This is, this is fantastic. Look at this, like people are coming and this is, people are converting. It's fantastic. It's great. And he said, the cross is absent here. There will be no fruit. <laughs> and we were all listening to the chapel going, oh, just you know, thinking of all of our future missions, you know what I mean? When things are going well and there are youth groups and kids and family groups and men's groups, women's groups, all things are, there's no cross here. Let's go. <laughs> you know, our hearts just sank. But that was the kind of man he was. I'm not afraid of opposition. I'm not afraid of opposition. It's said that in one particular parish mission, there was a tavern next door, and the tavern was like the antithesis of the chapel, right? People come to the chapel to pray and to be with God, and the tavern was where they did everything else. And um, during the parish mission, there was so much noise uh, and distraction coming from the tavern that he went over, and as they say, John waned the place. Uh, the following day, there were a number of limping black-eyed men uh, in the back of the church at the mission. So it wasn't that he was just kind of unleashing his fury and wrath, but he convinced them uh, to, come, to come to the mission. And I kind of like this, because then you see this kind of stuff just has no place right, in authentic spirituality and masculinity. You can be a man saint who loves Our Lady and still be a real man. And that's important. Uh, a very famous event from his life was he, just, he encouraged people in a place called Pont Chateau to build... Uh, uh, a Calvary walk 
up this hill. So the hill wasn't big enough, so they had to build the hill, or at least finish the hill, make the hill a little bigger. So they're carrying up rocks and carrying up uh, uh, the giant boulders that they use as a rosary beads, you know, uh, the, to tie it all together with chains. Very, very cool. Um, that's I'm sure what he called it as well. C'est très cool. Um, so uh, they had, they had, like there were mules and pe- I think about three or four hundred people building this hill. And then the French authorities accused him of building a bunker for holding weapons. They got onto his superiors, so the, the local bishop, who said, okay, this, this can't go ahead. The bishop was supposed to come and bless it, right? So it was finished. The bishop was supposed to come and bless it. And on that day, he gets the order instead to disband it. Now, you can imagine, like, you know, these kind of things did not happen quickly, and there were no tractors, so it's not like you just spend the day just on a digger, you know. You spend, like, shovel and mule and buckets, right? So it's hard, blistering work. And he's told then to just walk away from it. And he said, we had intended on building a Calvary here. Let us build it in our hearts instead. Praise be Jesus Christ. My goodness. I just feel like such a wuss when I hear things like that, you know. He's just such, I, I, he's, as, as a saint, he's fantastic. Such an exemplary priest and missionary and worker and preacher and devotee of Our Lady. So he talks about Our Lady in uh, in big terms. How can I say that even better? Uh, They almost sound exaggerated. Like he pushes Marian devotion as far as it can go. Uh, But he talks about Our Lady as the most perfect way to Jesus, the most perfect way. If we follow her example, since she never sinned, it means she never got it wrong. She never stepped out of communion with God. So she's the most perfect way to Jesus. She's also the, the easiest. Like there are many things that people did back in the day as well, like very, very long pilgrimages, Santiago de Compostela or Jerusalem, Rome, all these, these typical places of, uh, of, uh, of pilgrimage where after you went to maybe your once in a life time confession your penance was a very very long pilgrimage which could have taken months maybe even years that was your penance you know so devotion to our lady is an awful lot easier consecration to our lady is a lot easier than walking from here to rome uh, just consecrate yourself to our, to our lady but not flippantly meaning it like i, I want to give you everything so it's far easier and it's simple. Okay, so it's, it's not. So it's 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 the most perfect way. It's the easiest way. It's the safest way. If we think of even the study of scripture, if you study scripture alone, at the beginning you're ignorant of it. Then you get fairly maybe confident in your knowledge of scripture. And when you have that kind of confidence and and, and, and profundity of knowledge, it can it can lead you to pride. Man, I'm good. Right. I can read Greek and Hebrew and I, can, I know all these texts. I can even tell where the errors are in the translations. And it can lead you to, to, to pride, which then deviates us away from the truth. So we need a, a safe way to stay focused on the Lord while, while studying or while in, in, in our various, while living out our, our, our baptismal promises. And the safest way is Our Lady, through Our Lady, giving everything to her. She's also the shortest way to Christ. So it's, it's the most perfect way, the easiest way, the safest way, and the shortest way. She guides us straight to the heart of her son. So Louis Marie de Montfort is an example to each of us, and especially to us men, of what it means to be a devotee of Our Lady. It doesn't mean being soft or limp-wristed. It means manning up to our baptismal call to love Christ above all things and to put him in the first place to renounce Satan and all of his pomp and all of his empty promises of which there are many it's a calling to renounce ourselves in favour of something and someone greater it's a calling to true true, selfless self-effacing love 
And so we do so by entrusting ourselves, consecrating ourselves to Our Lady, that we might more perfectly belong to Jesus, following the example of St. Louis de Montfort, John Paul II, Padre Pio, Mother Teresa, and so many other wonderful saints. May we continue that tradition of entrusting ourselves and consecrating ourselves to Our Lady, that we can be the apostles of this new age in, I better change that term, of this new era in building up the kingdom of God. Amen.